Hello, I'm Lynn Jarvis, contributing editor for Across the Fence, and today we're in Southeast Asia in the Kingdom of Cambodia. I'm joined by WCX-TV Sharon Meyer, and Sharon, I think we and our viewers are in for an amazing adventure. No doubt about it. Well, after years of isolation and civil war, Cambodia became a monarchy in 1993, and already tourism has become their second revenue source just behind the textile industry. And I just read that oil and natural gas deposits have been discovered here and excavation will begin next year, undoubtedly bringing many more changes. I'm happy for the people, but then on the other hand, I'm glad that we're here now to see how things are before the petroleum revenues start coming in. So am I, so let's get started and see as much as we can. And we'll begin in Siem Reap in Northwest Cambodia, gateway to the Angkor region. And the best way to explore is to climb aboard a gasoline-powered tuk-tuk with a driver who can show us some highlights of this city of some 300,000 people. The Siem Reap of today is barely recognizable from just 10 years ago. Its proximity to the Angkor Wat temples have turned it into a boom town, attracting visitors from around the world. Yet, despite all the changes, Siem Reap remains a safe, friendly and pleasant place. Our first stop was Riverside Park, a relaxing and pretty place on the banks of the Siem Reap River where locals come to relax and read the morning paper. Something was going on nearby and I wandered over to see what it was. Two young men were enjoying a game of Chinlong, a popular sport in Cambodia with six players on each team. These two were practicing before they went to work. Back aboard the Tuk Tuk, we headed down Silvatha Street on our way to the old market, known as Pasa Chas. Ten years ago, it was one of the only shopping centers for locals, but now with so many tourists, there's something for everyone. And I found a pair of cargo pants, perfect for the hot, humid weather here, and a large towel worked just fine for a changing room. The waist was okay, but the pants needed to be shortened. In a matter of minutes, they were measured and hemmed, and I was on my way. Returning to our hotel, I reflected on Cambodia's turbulent past. Just 30 years ago, Pol Pot was making his totalitarian dream a deadly reality for more than a million people who did not meet or agree with his communist ideals. Those terrible days are just memories now, and so much has changed. Our guide, Sarnek Ui, remembers 10 years ago when electricity first came to his village near Siem Reap. About 2002, in that village, is no electric city at all. And the people have just a lamp or a little candle. So if they want to go outside, they need to carry a candle or something, and the cobra will everywhere. But the cobra, it makes noise when we go close to them. It opens the head and make noise, and people no, no, the cobra, we are them. People in village, they love eating cobra. So if the dog attack cobra, and then if we take the cobra, we can sell cobra, or we can exchange cobra with chicken, because some people, they like, they like cobra more than chicken. So one cobra, we can change for two chickens. And cobra, very tasty. I used to eat a few times, because my, my younger brother, he also love eating cobra. So one time, he made a, a cobra soup. I remember that much, much better than than chicken, very, very tasty than chicken. On our way to the floating fishing village of Chang Ness, we passed through the heart of the farming area. It didn't look like they had electricity yet, and believe you me, I kept an eye out for cobras. Malnutrition is widespread and helps to contribute to the infant mortality rate. About one in 10 children don't survive. Unbelievably, landmines still pose a hazard for youth who attempt to salvage unexploded ordnance to sell as valuable scrap metal. This small village is fortunate, however, because our tour company hires drivers in their ox carts to take us for a ride through town, and we're reminded not to forget a tip. Joining us on our Southeast Asia adventure were Joe Carroll, part of the WCX news team, and our new friend Darlene. My husband, Rainey, and I were assigned to the youngest driver in the group. He looked like he was about 9 or 10. And Marco Ayella, the video editor for our show today. 
With an average annual income in Cambodia of about $1,000, yes, I said annual, and 33% of the population below the poverty level, we knew our visit meant a lot to them. One of the main sources of income is raising ducks that are sold in Siem Reap for their eggs and meat, well suited as they easily adapt to the low and high water levels. About an hour later, we reached our destination, the launching area for our boat ride deep into the Cambodia that few people have ever seen. Here children gathered with hopes of getting a gift from tourists who passed by. This little guy knew his sister had a piece of candy and he let her know. It was time to board the boat for our tour to the floating fishing village of Chong Nies. We were here at the tail end of the monsoon season so water levels were very manageable. Impossible as it sounds, during the rainy months, the Tonlesap River reverses its flow and water is pushed up from the Mekong Delta, creating a lake covering about 1,000 square miles that can reach depths of 25 feet, making it the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. Now you will get to experience what a third world country is like as we float our way along the streets of Chong Nis. Sanitary conditions are of no concern and the river is the bathroom as well as the water supply for the 2,000 people who live here. I am surprised that the World Health Organization hasn't sent a team of physicians to study their immune systems that defy all odds. Just two years ago, the deceased were thrown into the river for the fish to eat. This new crematorium has changed that and I expect not for sanitary reasons, but to appease the increasing number of tourists who were appalled by the sight. These floating schools are an encouraging sign of progress, and as we passed by, classes were ending for the day and the children were headed home. Mostly run by charitable organizations from around the world, this school is called the Mission of Mercy. Our last stop was a souvenir shop being run by these two little boys whose parents had left them in charge while they went shopping in Siem Reap. Being the most exotic place I've ever visited, I had to bring some things home and ask Sarnak to help translate. I wanted two sequin bags for gifts and for me, a carved elephant and a can of Coca-Cola. We agreed on $21, a sweet deal for me and I hoped their parents would approve upon their return. But for now, everyone was happy. Thank you. Our last stop in Cambodia is here at Angkor Wat, meaning a city of temples. It is unrivaled in greatness and one of the wonders of the architectural world. And Sharon, we're about to begin our tour. What's the weather report for today? <laughs> it's already hot and humid and it's fairly early in the morning, so this is definitely gonna be a day for lots of water. The temples were built in the first half of the 12th century and dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, preserver of the universe. The wonder of being here, looking at them, evokes a real sense of awe. We cross this causeway to Angkor Wat, the seat of the mighty Khmer Empire, which ruled from the 9th to the 15th century. Their ultimate architectural masterpiece has five central towers evoking the peaks of Mount Muro, home of the Hindu gods, surrounded by a moat and protective walls. With three levels, the first was the Gallery of Teaching, where twice a month, pilgrims from throughout the kingdom would come to study the teachings of Vishnu. After graduating, they were allowed to rise to the second floor for meditation and other sacred religious ceremonies. The top level, however, represented paradise and a place for only the high priests and king to worship. All visitors, then and now, pass the most extraordinary displays of bas-relief, depicting stories and characters from Hindu religion and mythology to the military might of Suryavarman II, who ruled for 40 years with his troops of armor-clad soldiers and horses, followed by ranks of foot militia close behind. He is considered the empire's finest king and military leader, but his greatest legacy, without a doubt, is the building of Angkor Wat. 
Looking stunning in the setting sun, it was the center of the royal community and living quarters for some 20,000 members of the king's family, entourage, and caregivers. After the death of Sir Yervarman II in 1150, the Anchor region floundered until Jayarvarman VII took power in 1181. Instead of continuing the tradition of Hinduism, he adopted the Buddha of Compassion as his patron and took on more massive construction projects. His building campaign was unprecedented and happened at a frenetic pace. Hundreds of temples and monuments were constructed in less than a 40-year period, the most notable being Angkor Thom, that was to become the largest city of the Khmer Empire. With entrance gained through a series of gates and rows of stone Buddha heads that lined the path of its south entrance. The capital city of Angkor Thom is Banyan, that was reconstructed by the French they cleared out most of the spong trees and strangler figs, but left a few so visitors can see what rough conditions the temples were in when they started restoration. Banyan has some 500 towers with four huge carved faces on most of them. Each are 13 feet tall and oriented towards the four points of the compass. The faces all have the same strange smile and closed eyes, creating a mysterious and serene countenance representing an all-knowing inner peace. Historians say that the monastery, known as Ta Pram, was Jayavarman VII's favorite project as he dedicated it to his mother. It contains a maze of courtyards that runs through the vast structure of some 600 rooms and probably had a population of some 70,000 people. Ta Pram was used in both the game and movie versions of Tomb Raider, and this is the door where Angelina Jolie emerged from inside the temple. In 1992, the vast anchor complex was registered as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is maintained by preservation teams from around the world. Upon leaving, paying homage to Buddha is believed to bring inner peace and good luck for all those who have journeyed here. After a short flight, we are now in Vietnam in its largest city, Ho Chi Minh, with some nine million people. Formerly Saigon, the name was changed in 1975 after the communist takeover to honor Ho Chi Minh, the chairman of the Communist Party in Vietnam from 1941 to 1955. There are a few signs of those tumultuous days, however, and the city is now welcoming people from around the world. It's still Saigon to the locals, and a city of contrasts, from the beautiful Bitexco Financial Tower with 68 stories, designed to look like the butt of a lotus flower, to street vendors selling their goods to passers-by at bargain prices. Our walking tour began at the beautiful City Hall, built in the early 1900s in the French colonial style. Since it's the office of Ho Chi Minh City's People's Committee, it's not open to the public. Flower gardens and balloons surround a statue of Ho Chi Minh with his arm over the shoulders of a small child. Close by is the beautiful Notre Dame Basilica, built in the late 1800s during the French occupation with its two bell towers rising 190 feet into the sky. Since this was the end of the monsoon season, City Hall Park was a hub of activity and wedding photographers were making the most of it. These little girls were getting ready for a Saturday afternoon performance in the park. And this group was being filmed for a television commercial to advertise a new amusement area. In a more quiet spot, these teens were spending their Saturday afternoon playing cards. As you can see, Saigon is a city of youth who have never known the consequences of war. Only their parents and grandparents remember April 30, 1975, when tanks smashed the gates of their presidential palace, bringing an end to the war and the communist domination of Vietnam. Now the gates are open with daily tours for those who wish to step back in time and see the former center of the South Vietnamese government, which hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese and over 15,000 Americans died trying to save such a different and fascinating part of the world and I'm happy we can share it with all of you and Sharon what have you enjoyed the most? 
Well, Lynn, I'm actually surprised at how much I've enjoyed every single minute of our trip so far, but I especially loved the floating fishing village, kind of a Southeast Asia water world. I've never seen anything like it, and I'll certainly never forget it. Tomorrow we make our way north to Hanoi with many stops along the way, and I hope you can join us for that. From Sharon and me, halfway around the world, thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.